Ravi Sala. I'm uh, I work with Guide on Energy. Um, and uh, sorry, let me just. And I'm happy to uh, be hosting the North Texas Pug 2021 Spring Seminar. Uh, so welcome. Uh, it's a virtual meeting. We would have loved to it for it to have been in person, but we're uh, we're not there yet. Wanted to start by just saying thank you to our speakers today. <clears throat> We've got Jeffrey with Blue Marble Geographics. Um, so I want to thank, thank them. And also we've got Melita Kennedy from Esri. So thanks to the both of you for presenting today. We really appreciate it. Uh, I've just got sort of a, just an introductory slide. Just wanted to spend a minute just describing who we are. We're the North Texas Pug. So we're a regional pug. Um, and you know, we're, we're pretty vital in kind of coming together, all the regional pugs, to kind of achieve the goal of the overall pug mission. And so this diagram kind of shows some of our focus areas, um, everything from local network to uh, local networking to managing local activity, um, all the while supporting the global uh, pug mission. So I've got a, a shameless uh, snapshot off of our, off of uh, the pug website, just which mentions the mission is essentially just striving to be recognized as a professional organization uh, across the petroleum industry and really have a focus on collaboration and, and, um, and improving and enhancing the use of GIS and geospatial workflows. So that's kind of who we, who we are. Uh, I'm a member of the steering committee along with Karen Motley from Pioneer, Ryan Kearney from Goodnight, Will Flanagan from Flat Creek, and Skylar Smith. From, uh, Esri as well. And <clears throat> just wanted to put at the bottom here the ways to kind of uh, stay in touch. And, and um, one is through LinkedIn. We've got a LinkedIn group, um, which I'll drive to in just a second. We've also got a website, which is really just a subset of the main of the main PARG website. Just to quickly show you, this is our uh, Pug North Texas chapter group. So feel free to do a search. We'll get you added to the group. This is a great place to share information uh, with your peers. And then um, hop over here. This is the URL that I was showing on the slide to our little North Texas Pug page where we've got just a little bit of information, but lots of just a plethora of information about the, the Pug, uh, overall Pug uh, as well uh, at this, you know, at this website. So I encourage you to go and look at that at your leisure and, and really welcome uh, welcome you to join the group. Um, that being said, we need volunteers. <clears throat> uh, quickly, it, we don't, the commitment is minimal. We really want volunteers. We, we've been meeting since COVID's been going on. I know it's been a while since our last meeting, it's uh, June, I believe, of 2020. And um, we've been meeting monthly to keep up and, tossing around ideas for webinars and kind of keeping in touch. And we really realized that it, we could open it to a broader audience. So, so when we say volunteers, it's not even necessarily anything other than maybe once a month getting together with us to bounce ideas off of each other, talk about what's new, um, and of course plan for these, uh, these webinars that we try and do twice a year. So please reach out, email any of us, reach out through the through the LinkedIn page. Um, you can reach us through the email that you find on the website as well. I'll post that at the end. And uh, don't be shy, we don't bite. And it's, uh, it's a great group, it's really fun. <clears throat> so just quickly, the agenda today, uh, we're gonna get right into exploring the GeoCalc online with Jeffrey uh, from Blue Marble Geographics. He'll have about uh, probably 30 minutes or so um, 30 to 35, and then maybe five or so minutes of questions that we'll uh, open up the floor to and ask you to unmute your mic to ask those questions at the end when Jeffrey concludes. And then after that, we'll mute the mics again. We'll hear from uh, Melita Kennedy from Esri uh, about what's new in the Esri projection engine. So again, at the end of um, her talk, which will probably last around half an hour or so, uh, we'll unmute the mics and uh, invite questions that anybody might have. So, um, and then we'll wrap up uh, at the end and, and uh, have some concluding remarks and, and get an update uh, from Sam. I'm sure everybody knows Sam Rosario, get an update on some of the upcoming ESRI events um, to be uh, on the lookout for. So without further ado, I will stop sharing my screen and hand 
over control to Jeffrey. Jeffrey, if you want to try and share your screen. Okay, thank you, Bobby. Thanks for the introduction. Um, is my screen coming through okay? Let's see. Yes. Great. Yes, I'm seeing your screen. You're you're free to go. Great. Okay. Well, thank you for all of you who are here today. Um, I'm going to be talking about exploring um, GeoCalc online. Uh, so a little bit about me. Um, I have been with Blue Marble Geographics for about five years, uh, and I'm a product manager here. Uh, in this role, I help to oversee all the planning, research, and development that's associated with the creation of new features, new software products, um, one of those, obviously, being GeoCalc Online. Um, I also handle training and technical talks like this. Uh, I'll get involved with some more advanced technical support uh, as well from time to time. So I know um, we may have some Blue Marble users in, in the audience today. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Blue Marble, um, we are a geospatial software company uh, which started in the early 90s in, in Maine, in the state of Maine, and with the real focus on high accuracy uh, geodetic transformation tools. Um, in the oil and gas space, um, geographic calculator is by far our most heavily used tool. So, you know, some of you may, may be familiar with that. And we also have a full desktop GIS suite with Global Mapper and the LiDAR module, uh, along with a mobile application. So you may have heard of us in, in any one of those um, venues as well. Um, today, we're going to talk about GeoCalc Online, which is a little bit a uh, newer tool for us. Um, we've hosted it now for uh, about three years. Um, what we'll be looking at today, though, comes after uh, what I guess is our second major update um, to the tool. And so we're going to look at some of the new functions associated with that. Um, you know, why do we as, as, as users care about what's here um, and what can it do for us um, as a free product that we can access online and, and use to supplement some of our geodetic and um, our surveying work. You know, so we'll look at updated lookup methods, how we can access and share this information. You know, very often we use geodetic repositories of this nature um, for research and to confirm information and share that with our, our colleagues and our clients. Uh, we'll look at some of the cloud-based transformation tools that we have up here. Um, one of the great things about this as a web service um, is that we can keep it fully up to date pretty easily with all the other major uh, repositories out there. So, you know, whether we're pulling from the NGS or IOGPs, you know, EPSG registry, um, we'll talk about all that in detail, um, but we can pull from all that live and make sure that everything is up to date. So we're going to look at the site live in a second. Um, before we do so, though, just a little overview of, of what I'm going to try to hit on today. So I'll introduce the site, uh, GeoCalc Online, and we'll talk about um, searching the registry and interacting with definitions. So the registry, um, you know, very often we may refer to that as a data source or the repository. That's where all of our geodetic definitions are. That could be a definition for a coordinate reference system, which, you know, we'll look at heavily today. Um, but that could also, you know, expand to areas of use, vertical datum, um, um, geocentric systems. So the whole suite of it um, is all available here. And we're going to talk about all the ways we can, we can use this um, in our workflow as a reference and as a tool. Um, specifically, that, that tool would be the calculator. So we're going to look at some ways um, I like to frame it, how our field users might work if we're somebody out in the field or both literally and you know metaphorically now as we work from home, um, how we, how we can how we can utilize that tool as well. Um, I am if I have time at the end, I like to talk about well, a little bit less on geocalc updates and, and more focused on some of the geodetic uh, geospatial changes we can expect both here in the U.S. and internationally um, in the coming years. Um, but with that being said, let's just go ahead and kick over and look at the tool. 
So hopefully now everybody is seeing my web browser and this is um, on the live homepage of GeoCalc Online. Um, anybody on the web can visit this site. There's no restrictions here. Uh, as I mentioned, it has been live for almost three years. Um, some of you may have stumbled across it in the past and you know, Google search looking for geodetic repository. Maybe you intentionally found it because you were aware of us and so you were coming here to do some work. Um, it will look a bit different. It recently got um, a little bit of a UI overhaul with some of the new functionality that was added. Uh, this was all back now, probably around Thanksgiving time or so. Uh, at its core, what this tool is, is a database of all of our geodetic definitions. It also happens to tie into all of our other software products, although you know, for today's use case and really in general that you don't have to be a user of our other products, this is fully accessible, um, you know, again, to be used by anybody. Um, it provides us with a search portal so we can, you know, research, search and find um, any, any definitions that we may need to. Uh, it's flexible, right? So today I'm working on a desktop or technically a laptop, um, but it now has a full mobile browser component. So the UI adjusts for that. Um, and I'm going to frame some things a little bit later on in the scope of that, unfortunately. Um, I can't be on a phone today for that, but we'll get the idea. So this is just the start page here that we're looking at right now. Um, gives us an overview of, of what's what um, and, and kind of sets the stage for what we may, may do next. Uh, it is worth noting I'm on the live site now. Um, I haven't ever had any issues with bandwidth at my house while also streaming, but you never know. So in case that happens today, um, I do have some backup slides. First thing that we are going to take a look at is the search tool. We're gonna to talk about a whole different ways we can search our geodetic objects. So from the search page, um, we have two main functions or actions we can take. Uh, on the left-hand side, we have our advanced search. We'll dig into that shortly. That's really where I want to you know, pare down and, and you know, really get into finding objects. But right at the center here, um, our map search, and you'll see my map has already updated. So um, my location here, right, my browser has my location permissions. So we've got the location, you know, for where I am. I live in Western New York. Um, so we've got my location there. Anytime I perform a search um, based on a location, that will return definitions for that region. I could also, you know, I could specify, maybe I want to use a bounding box, right? And let's just say we're, we're in Texas today. Most of you anyway, I assume are. I can define a bounding box of interest. And when I perform that search, what I see then are definitions that are valid for that specific area. And that's a very great, um, quick, easy way to return a large amount of information. But for many of us, we're looking for something specific. And I don't need to see you know, 530 results across a variety of categories. I've been tasked with um, finding coordinate system X or datum Y, whatever the case may be. And I need to do so efficiently, right? Whether I'm you know, answering a question quicker for a client or in the field and not wanting to poke around on a mobile device too long. Uh, and that's really where um, the advanced search functionality comes into play here. For instance, let's just say, you know, right off the bat, maybe I'm just going to perform a search for Texas, um, a very, a very broad search, admittedly. Um, when I run that, we'll see my my results shrink down a little bit, right? I've provided um, specific text that I want to find, so I'll have fewer results, but I still have them across right, a variety of categories. Maybe I'm looking for, you know, a geodetic coordinate system, right? I can find those um, and navigate to uh, what I'm looking for. I generally, though, I really want, you know, I'm concerned with um, making this as efficient and quick as possible. So what I like to do is take a look at all of my filters. And we have, you know, a large amount of filters here based on uh, really whatever geodetic definition or object you want to filter by. So you're only really getting that information that you need. Our default generally is vertical and horizontal coordinate systems and then transformations. For right now, argument's sake, 
let's say I'm just looking for projected systems in Texas. I can rerun that search. I'll see now I only have one category of results. And now we can begin thinking about how I can work with this information. Right, my results page here is relatively high level uh, and I probably want to dig into the details of the system. Let's say for argument's sake, maybe we're concerned with you know, NAD 27, the older um, in, in Texas North, right? The state plane here. Navigating into uh, a definitions information page is really where we begin to get all of that great, you know, geodetic detail that we want. Um, you know, very often we're concerned with making sure we're in that right system because being in that right system gets us the right coordinate, gets us the right transformation, it gets me the right you know, volume calculation or whatever I'm working with down the road. So we can see, you know, those, those geodetic uh, parameters, the associated projection parameters for that uh, state plane projection. What's often important to many of us, right? These days, you know, we're working across so many different software providers and authorities uh, and sources of information that we want to be able to identify those, you know, you know from one to the other. So the identifier section here, you know, it's not really flashy um, or important, but it gives me a very easy way to see, okay, I can see how BMG defines this. More importantly, probably how the EPSG or the OGP or whoever else is also defining and storing these systems to make sure I really am working with uh, the system that I expect that I am working with. We're also probably going to be concerned with things like area of use. You know, I can see my area of use. Okay, here we are, right? North Texas, that's where I expect that, that system to exist for its bounds. Um, if we really need to get into the nitty gritty, into the, the you know, uh, the, the base geodetic or the, you know, getting into the projection itself, right? Uh, Texas North is a Lambert projection. So if we need to get into that information. All of it is available to us here. Oh, you know, we also might want to take a look at, so usages, or a usage, I should say, um, is one of the new uh, updates to the EPSG models that came out fairly recently. Uh, we can think of a usage as a little bit higher level uh, to an area of use, right? So a usage, if we go ahead and take a look at this usage, will actually contain an area of use in addition to what the EPSG is now um, calling a scope. So a scope kind of tells me in what realm the specific coordinate reference system is used and then physically in what area. Um, so just a new layer of information. Um, we'll talk about why that's important a little bit later on. When, once I've identified and found uh, you know, my, my definition of interest, that's when we start to think about um, how can I share it? Right, because most likely I'm, I'm finding this information because I need to either verify what I found and then reference or share what I've verified. Uh, we have a variety of ways that that can be done. Probably most user-friendly, printing the definition, this will create a printer formatted page, print it, you're good to go. Um, what we see more on the technical side is users need this in a GML or a WKT, some kind of format. We can get that definition fairly quickly, you know, copy, paste it, send it to whoever you need to, and, and you're good to share uh, that information. Also worth noting, if you ever need to reference directly to GeoCalc online, you know, maybe you need to say to your client, you know, this is where I got that information from, and you can reference their identifiers as well. Grabbing a URL to this page will give us that same result. You can reference that URL to um, the specific definition level as well. Right, so a couple, couple great ways we can you know, do some research, uh, whether we're just trying to find, identify, and share um, those objects via the search tool. Um, the search tool though, we can also use as part of uh, the calculation or the transformation process. So we're gonna segue over to that here briefly before looking at how we can combine the two. Uh, for any of our users who are here today and for those who might be familiar with Geographic Calculator, um, what this point-to-point -point calculator in GeoCalc Online is, 
is essentially what we call the interactive job in the desktop application. Um, why we care about this is because um, it allows me to perform um, three different types of operations to transform between a point or transform you know, from one point to another. Uh, a convert operation is fairly standard. We're converting from one coordinate reference system to another. Forward and inverse operations, uh, which we're gonna look at as well, at least a forward operation, um, they allow us to essentially determine a point or the distance in bearing, um, distance in azimuth, I should say, between two points. So I know where I am in the field. I need to figure out how to get to my next point, where my next point should be, or maybe how to get between uh, two known points. First thing I want to highlight, so there's a couple little handy tools that are built right into this. So let's say I'm transforming a point and um, what I care about, just a test point here near our office in Maine. So I'm gonna transform this and let's just go right now. We will go to the 2011 realization of NAT83. Normally I have the ability to specify what transformation I wanna use between systems. However, in this case, we only have really one way to go, happens to be via Geocon between WGS84 and NAT83 2011. So the app knows that, um, saves us the time of having to, to pick unnecessarily what we may want to use. Should also point out, it's, it's worth highlighting that when picking uh, any system, doesn't really matter, we'll look at a North America system here, we can further confirm it's the right one rather than having to perform a search. I can get right to the info page here. And I can say, okay, yes, this is the correct, the correct system that I want to, to use um, as part of my, my calculation. And then running that calculation is, is fairly straightforward. Not a big shift here, obviously, between, uh, between these two. Um, anytime we do work with, um, you know, anytime we need to use any of these grid files for shifts, um, all of this should be built right into to the web app, so you're not going to have to download or look for um, anything specific for these type of transformations, uh, assuming you're not working with anything um, restricted. Um, a lot of international stuff can be restricted. Um, probably not an issue in North Texas, but um, everything should be there for you. But let's talk about, I want to talk and frame this a little bit in the scope of why I might use this and how I might use this in the field as an end user. Um, you know, let's say I need to, uh, in this scenario, actually, I want to update an older surveyed point um, from, we're going to look at the older Texas Shackleford system. Um, so let's say I have a point in Shackleford and I want to update it to, um, we'll update it to a newer state plane system here. And when I do so, right, I'm going to restrict my search just to projected. Quickly allows me to get um, to that system. Uh, we'll notice, so the search tool is also going to return uh, a related system, right? So Texas State Mapping System is just one of the updates to Shackleford. So we'll see that as well. I can always go into my system of interest to make sure it's the right one. Um, I personally am a fan of always giving that info a quick check, right? We always want to make sure we're, we're grabbing the correct uh, coordinate reference system when we're starting to perform any sort of calculations. What I'll do is quickly set that as the source system. So I'm converting, going to be converting from Shackleford. And then my target, in this case, I'm going to search by EPSG code and grab then um, we'll work in North Texas feet here. Again, we have both the foot and the metric version returned to us. Um, we're going to work in US feet today, though. So the tool now is ready to go. I don't need to work through any of the, the pick lists here to find those objects. Um, maybe not as much of a hassle on uh, desktop. Much easier to do so from the search when you're when you're on your your mobile device. Let me grab, I think this is the point that I had tested earlier. Let's hope it is. Um, I have my 
my point now, we'll call this our survey point. And what running this transformation is gonna do is gonna update this, the, this coordinate from the NAD27 Shackleford to the newer NAD2011 uh, Texas North. So in this case, right, there's a variety of ways I could go about doing this. Um, maybe I have the name of the system I know memorized. If not, I might take a look at um, the info for that system if needed. Um, in this case, I know I want to use the, the NADCON uh, CONUS transformation for us here. And so once that's set, um, one of the things I like about this tool, at least from my end user perspective, right? I can see all the steps being taken through that NADCON 5 process. Uh, and so I can confirm what's being done. Calculating that point then um, gives me my, my coordinate now in that, in that new system. So if I'm confirming, hey, was this converted correctly? You know, maybe with some reference data, I have those values now and I can work with them uh, as I need to. I do want to take a second here uh, to take a look at a forward job. Uh, the reason being, um, very often we have, you know, field users across industries uh, who say, you know, I'm in the field and I'm, I'm updating older surveys or I'm starting a rough outline of a new area, whatever, whatever that may be. Um, and I, I only know, you know, certain points or a couple bearings to get from one point to the other. What's the best way that in the field um, I can do this? So if we were on a mobile device now, um, what I would do is essentially the same thing we had done. Uh, I would start with a search because I find that the easiest way to populate um, my converter. Uh, we're going to work on NAT83 because that's the EPSG code I had memorized today. Uh, oh, I want to geodetic system, not a transformation. And I'm going to set this both as my source and my target. The reason being, anytime we are going to calculate a forward or inverse, um, it's going to rely on the distance in azimuth, and we need that to be on the same geodetic, on the same datum to do so. So let's say this is my given uh, name. It doesn't have to have a name, but let's say I'm working. Where did I have that? There we go. So this should be in Northwest Texas, right? And I have my, my point. Um, I know where this was and I'm here. I don't know though what I'm looking for at my endpoint. Maybe I'm trying to find an old survey marker or maybe I'm just going to map out the next edge of my, my potential well site, right? Whatever the case may be. I know I have to move 6,000 feet and I know I have to do so at an azimuth of 135 degrees. I do need to specify my units as feet. Uh, we'll use US survey foot since um, that will be deprecated soon. We'll give it one more run. We'll talk about that, that deprecation in a little bit here. Um, but so once I have um, specified my source point and my, my distance and azimuth that I need to travel, uh, calculating this is going to give me now my new location. So I know that I've traveled 6,000 feet and specified direction to this new point. So if I'm in the field, I'm checking this on my, my mobile device while I also have maybe my, you know, my GPS unit with me or whatever the case may be. So I can figure out um, if I'm close enough to, to where I need to be. Now, in this case, you know, realistically in the field, I probably work in a projected system, right? So I have a little bit, a little bit more granularity working in, you know, in, in linear units rather than geodetic, you know, latitude, longitude, but uh, same idea applies. And, you know, I, I know we're on um, desktop here, right? Um, but this is a great example. Um, I actually had someone who was, who was doing this for, um, they were roughing out a pad site and all these pad sites had only been given one survey corner and he knew I need to go X distance and at what bearing I had to go. How do I figure out where I need to go in the field? Um, maybe you're tracking down old survey markers, whatever the case may be. Uh, really handy to be able to do that 
um, on your phone. Yes, you will need a data connection, right? To hit hit the web the web service. Um, but other than that, a, a really easy uh, route to take there. Let's um, let's switch gears here. Um, I don't think it's a good use of our time to dig much more into the nuts and bolts of this site. Um, this is a good introduction, um, but I do want to talk a little bit more, I will say generically from a geodetic perspective. So let me pull my slides up again here. Um, so I had talked about, uh, this should probably say just geodetic updates, um, but updating GeoCalc online. And when I say that, I'm not referring to necessarily the website and the UI itself, um, but the underlying uh, data source and geodetic information that we're sharing, right? We looked through quickly anyway, um, a few different search tools and a few different definitions today. Um, and, and more would have been available to us if we wanted to dig into, you know, units of measure or um, vertical datum and things of that nature, all of that's available to us there. But what I care about is the accuracy and how up to date all of that information is. Um, I had mentioned that we do keep all of this, um, you know, regularly up to date, whether we're talking about um, the NGS library. So they, they publish quite a few of those. Um, IOGP is what they now call is the EPSG geodetic parameter data set. That's a mouthful of a name now. <laughs> um, but that as well, along with a few others, both um, domestic and internationally. And this is important to us, um, but more so to our user base, right? And so anybody who comes to this site, um, whether they're coming intentionally, you know, maybe they've heard this talk, they're one of our users, or they, they came across it on Google, right? We want um, a user to always get the latest and most updated information because that's what's gonna be important when we're in the field and we're making decisions or, you know, we're in some other situational awareness context where I need to make sure I literally am where I think I am. Um, I'd also hinted that we have a lot coming down the road, new both from the EPSG uh, and NOAA in the NGS. And so we're thinking about, you know, what's next for us at, as geospatial users um, geodetically. Uh, so we looked at at least a scope and a usage quickly, um, but the new EPSG model updates also contain uh, ensembles and dynamic data. Um, a little bit probably beyond this talk to dig into what all of those mean. Um, an ensemble we can think of as a grouping of multiple realizations um, of the same coordinate reference system or data. WGS84 is a great example of that, right? We have the original WGS84, and then we have all of the updates to it, whether, you know, G1150, uh, et cetera, et cetera. An ensemble can group all of those and allow us to reference just one more broadly. Um, generally more useful when we're working, looking at uh, lower accuracy um, situations. So probably not survey grade. Um, and then dynamic datum, as the name may hint, um, datum that will allow us or will be designed um, to be updated more frequently. And that is important because it ties into the NGS's um, NSRS modernization, which is currently well underway. Um, and it's going to provide or allow GeoCalc Online will be set to have access to all of that. Um, this was actually recently pushed by NGS um, from originally 2022 to now tentatively 2025. Um, but regardless, when that does happen, um, it's going to be a major change for all of us as geodesists or surveyors or anybody with an interest in geodetics who's doing some sort of work navigating in the field. Um, to whatever level geodetics gets exciting for us, um, I think that this, this will be that level of excitement. Um, I know the next talk 
coming up here is going to talk on this a little bit, so I don't want to uh, get into it too much here. But um, you know, an interesting note for those of us who think who work with uh, you know the National Geoid, right? Um, the new geoid in the U.S., which will be called NAPGD22, um, that's going to be our first uh, dynamic geoid uh, that we've ever had nationally in the U.S. Um, all of the new horizontals, and there will be a few reference frames, um, are going to be updated for us now every five years. Um, so gone are the days of, you know, the lag from NAD27 to NAD83 to um, kind of the hodgepodge updates to NAD83 since then. Um, the goal is to have regular five-year updates to um, all of those systems. And so what we care about is that GeoCalc Online, anybody who goes to visit it, um, is going to have access to that information, um, you know, as they need it, just like uh, we saw today fairly quickly, fairly straightforward, um, and ideally even more um, mobile friendly as, as we make that trend to, to working more with mobile devices. Um, so without dragging too much longer, um, one last thing I want to touch on very quickly um, before I take any questions, uh, if we do have um, any users here today, and I mean users as in Blue Marble users or anybody who's familiar with Blue Marble, two quick things I want to highlight since I know GeoCalc Online will probably new to all of you, but new, even new to some of our Blue Marble users. Um, it will integrate with all of your Blue Marble apps that you're currently working with. So whether you're using Global Mapper, one of our SDKs, et cetera, um, you can set those apps up to work with GeoCalc Online. And in many instances, um, it may already be doing so. Uh, a little bit more interest in the oil and gas sector. So something to be aware of for those of you who work with um, maybe some of the oil and gas majors. Uh, GeoCalc Online is fully customizable and, and has been customized already for some of those. Uh, oil and gas majors. So if you're someone, um, maybe you work with a lot of custom geodetic definitions, uh, you know, today, right, anything we sell on GeoCalc Online will be publicly defined somewhere, whether that's NGS, another international authority, um, EPSG, whoever it may be, um, what's there live to the public and free to everybody like we saw um, will be those publicly defined systems. If you're someone who works with custom things, we can talk about that offline outside of this talk, um, but GeoCalc Online can be set to, to hold that. So feel free to you know, get my email from the hosts today and we can that's a conversation we can have. Other than that, um, thank you all for listening to me today. Um, I know a lot of us use a variety of GIS and geospatial tools. Um, I do in my day to day outside of just Blue Marble. That's another one I think will be great to add, um, you know, to our geospatial software, Swiss Army Knife, or whatever we want to call it. Um, I hope you found this useful, um, and that at least some of you are, you know, going to go check out GeoCalc Online, um, you know, test it out in your workflows if you're back out in the field or back in the office. Uh, other than that, I'm happy to um, answer any questions. Great. Thanks, Jeffrey. Great presentation. Um, Thank you. We've got a couple minutes for questions. If anybody's got them, I don't know if Sam, maybe, I don't know if, I guess you don't have to do anything. I think the user would just unmute themselves. So if anybody's got any questions, um, let's hear it. Yeah, I got a question. Sure, go ahead. Sure. Hey, Jeffrey, uh, thanks, first of all, for taking time out of your afternoon to talk to us. Uh, I have a question. You brought up pad locations a little bit ago, and I was just wondering if you already have a tool somewhat incorporated in here where you can give like longs for the centroid of a pad, and then maybe you can give it like a three mile or a, or sorry, three acre and five acre size, and then kind of move it out to northwest corner, Northeast corner, southwest corner. Is that something that you guys have? So your audio broke up a little bit there. I think you were asking if we have a way to to track log that as a, a pad site or something was being recorded. 
Was that was that the gist of your question? More more in terms of like using your tool, could I enter in a lat long for what I want to be center of a new pad location and then have your tool spit out the coordinates? Hey, hey Ryan, I don't mean to interrupt, but it seems like you're too far away from your mic. We can barely yeah. hear you. <laughs> huh. All right. Well, I, I have a headset on, so <laughs> So maybe speak a little bit louder. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yeah, much better. Thank you. Okay, that's weird. I'm putting it like right up to my mouth. So can you put, can you enter in coordinates for the center of a new pad and have the blue marble tool spit out coordinates for the four corners of that pad and either give it, you know, like a, a three acre or a five acre pad size? Uh, so that wouldn't that wouldn't be GeoCalc online like we talked about today, um, but we do have other tools that would do that. Yes, um, so a little bit beyond the specific scope of this, um, but there is a whole pad siting or you know digitizing tool in the desktop, um, you know, kind of a build it once and then insert it everywhere you need it type deal. So yes, but not GeoCalc online. Yep. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have any questions for Jeffrey? If not, um, we can also revisit if we need to ask any questions after Malika's talk. We've got a couple minutes at the end, so we can we can save them for then. Um, it's about three forty-five, so um, Jeffrey we might ask you to, I guess, yeah. maybe stop sharing your screen. All right. <clears throat> there you go, and then. Um, Melita, if you're ready, uh, you can. All right. Okay, I see the sharing. Yeah, yeah, we've we've got you. Okay, so, uh, cool. All yours. Excellent. Hi, if you don't know me, I my name is Melita Kennedy. I'm a product engineer at Esri, and my focus is what we call the Esri Projection Engine, that's extremely low-lying library at the guts of most of Esri's products that support map projections, datum transformations, vertical transformations, all that fun stuff like that. So this talk's gonna be kind of a kind of scattered across the board and what, what are some of the newer things that we've added into the projection engine over the last couple of years? And we'll get started. So I'll hit the 2022 thing a little bit too. I know Jeffrey's already talked about it, but um, NGS is planning to update the coordinate reference systems for the US. Uh, it was supposed to be kind of the next year and now it's been delayed to 2025, yay. Uh, so there's gonna be several geodetic systems north for North America, the Pacific, Mariana and for the Caribbean. Then of course, there's gonna be the, the NAPGUD 2022, which is the, the vertical coordinate reference system. Um, and they're good, then they'll release a geoid model along with that to, um, to define that. We do plan to support all of these coordinate reference systems and transformations. You'd be amazed how many people have said, are you gonna, guys gonna be supporting this? Yes, of course we're gonna be supporting this. We have to. So they're also gonna release uh, state playing coordinate systems for 2022. Uh, one thing I'm really looking forward to is that there's gonna be multiple levels uh, for each state. So NGS is defining statewide projected coordinate reference systems for all the states, hooray. There's also gonna be zone systems very similar to what we have now with state plane system. And then states could opt to create low distortion projected CRS as well. And so a lot of the states that already had those like Wisconsin and Minnesota and Oregon, uh, Iowa, Indiana, uh, a couple others have basically um, submitted those to NGS for approval. And I know that some states didn't quite meet the parameters that NGS wanted. So they're having to negotiate on whether they're going to change those or whether they'll get a exemption, exemption or not. Uh, and we, you know, of course, we'll add all those. There's some examples already available on the NGS website, so you can look at how that they're working those out. One thing that they're going to do is they're going to support the same map projections, so oblique Mercator, uh, transverse Mercator, and Lambert conformal conic. 
but the landmark conformal conic version will be slightly different than what we currently use for state plane, which is a two standard parallel case. The new one's going to be basically a latitude of center, a latitude of origin, and then a scale factor, which has been more commonly used in outside of the US, for instance, in Europe. Uh, we've just added that as a, as a separate uh, variant in the software on the uh, last release or so. So we have that already in and ready to go for when this goes live in a couple of years. The, um, you could, it was already supported, but kind of in a weird, awkward way. And we wanted to make sure that people didn't have to work with that going forward. And then as Jeffrey also said, hey, goodbye US survey foot. I know there's been a lot of chatter about that on various surveyor forums who, you know, pe people are like really unhappy about it. Basically you can still use it, but NGS software, NGS will only support the other foot, the international foot version. So I like to sh show what's going on with other people on our team. This is kind of a list of the map projections we support, things that are in light blue or the more newer ones. For instance, natural earth, equal earth, um, the, that Lambert from a conic version. And most of you will never end up using any of these, right? Because they're designed for world usage. They're not designed for oil and gas industry. But anyway, I want to show a couple of those really quickly. So here's one that's called aspect adaptive. And you can actually very finely con control the map width or height. For instance, if you were going to be putting it into a document and you had limited space or a certain size of space you needed, then you could use this to to modify your map to fit that. <coughs> the raster team came to us a couple of releases ago wanting to support the GOES weather satellites. So we put in a geostationary satellite projection to support them. So you may or may not be using that with some of your um, usage. A funky Pierce Concuncio projection, which is world, which is conformal, which is unusual for small scale projections, and it's also tileable as well. The Guillot projection, which is actually a variant on the Pierce, also conformal. And then an interesting one called Spielhaus projection blew up on, okay, the tiny corner of Twitter that's like the cartographers were talking about this projection a couple of years ago, Spielhaus, it actually has uh, connected oceans. So it's good for showing ocean routing or uh, um, ocean current data. Uh, as you can see, looking at the countries that are not near the center of the map, it's crazy distorted once you move away from the oceans. So you would really only want to use this for ocean data or ocean uh, applications. So one thing one of my colleagues, Boyan uh, Showerich worked on was his, what he calls a projection wizard. It's designed to improve analysis results. And basically what it does is given your data extent and location, and then what you want to do with that data, what kind of analysis you're doing, it will design a custom coordinate reference system for that data that can be used. So it's currently being used, excuse me, in portal for aggregate points and summarize within. It's been added into the pro version 2.7 in the map. So you can go ahead and design one if you want. And then some of the geostatistical analysis tools also use it. For the tools, it's basically behind the scenes. Like you would never be able to, to get to that information. It's all used behind the scenes for the analysis. And then whatever you've decided to use for your output uh, coordinate reference system, then we would reproject into that from that analysis coordinate reference system. So I wanna talk a bit about transformations. So again, of course, we've got the geographic data transformations and the vertical transformations. And you know, we all know that for two different geographic coordinate reference systems, we might be lucky and there's one transformation available, but more than likely there's either none or there's a whole bunch. So in this case, of course, one of the worst ones, NAD27 and WC84, there's currently 33 different variants of that. And they all have different, accur different accuracies and different extents. So here's an example that's being used again from my, my colleague who's from Slovenia. So 
here's an example where his country is very good because it has different levels of transformations, just like the state plane stuff for, for the 2022. So the older datum in there is D48, that's the local datum. And then they now have moved to ETRS 89, which of course is earth centered and is more accurate. So there is multiple transformations with different areas and ex or different extents. And each of those will have different accuracies depending on the extent. So for instance, there is a countrywide one. There's this one where it, the country has been divided into three areas. And then finally, there is one where they've divided the country into seven different areas. So when you go and you look at like, say the project tool or your in map and you open up the, the properties pages for that and you go to transformations, you know, we give you this big list of transformations and it is a sorted list. We do sort this list. So I wanna to talk to you a little bit about how we're doing that. Well, you know, what's the algorithm behind that when we give you this sorted list. So the first thing we'll do for that is we'll actually do envelope intersections of the geographic coordinate systems, the from and the to. So in this case, D48 and ETRS89. All of the coordinate reference systems, so geographic, projected, and vertical, all the transformations all have an envelope associated with them. EPSG, where we get a lot of our data, also has polygon extents for these, um, these objects. Currently, we're not using those yet in Esri software. And then once we do the, the coordinate reference system uh, uh, intersections, we'll also intersect the transformation extents and the data extents as well. So for him, instance, here we go, we're gonna intersect D48 and ETRS89, and we know that, that that intersection covers the entire country, that's good. Now we're gonna to look at the data extent and compare it against what transformations are available for the country. In this case, it falls into both central and Southeast areas and they both have 100% coverage for the data. So once we do that, if we've got more than one transformation that has 100% coverage of our data extent, then we look at the accuracies and we tie break. So in this case, the central transformation has 0 0.3 meters, while the southeast one has 0 0.5 meters. So in this case, if we looked at a list of transformations for this data, we would get the central transformation listed first, and then we would follow that by the Southeast one. I won't lie to you, it's really easy to fool this algorithm, particularly in Pro, which always dumps in a base map first. Uh, we've talked in house about whether we, uh, we ignore the base map when we, we call for, the, for this uh, function that generates this list. And we've there's reasons why and reasons why, why we don't want to do it. We've kind of gone back and forth and we still haven't made a real solid decision on what to do about that. But just realize that that if you have a stray layer you haven't gotten rid of and you've moved your extents around, you've moved your area of interest around, then that may be throwing off the algorithm when it gives you that sorted list. So vertical transformations have been in there for a while, but they're still newer. So if like for the project tool, there is a checkbox to allow you to do vertical. That was you know piecemealed onto the existing tool. And then you will get usually a much longer list up to four different steps to get you from your input uh, uh, horizontal and vertical coordinate systems to your output horizontal and vertical coordinate systems. If you see that little, uh, there's a tiny little like tilde in front of a transformation occasionally in the tool. That means we're gonna be running that in the reverse direction. So in this case, for this first one, we will be going from NAT83 NAT 2011 to uh, WS84 in, in the ITRF00 emulation. So there's different types of vertical transformations we're supporting. One is uh, using a geoid model. So you'd be going from Geographic coordinate system A from VCS1 or VCSA, sorry, starting from the bottom going up to VCSA. So going from, let's say, ellipsoidal heights to gravity related heights. We might also have a 3D geographic transformation. For instance, we've got latitude, longitude, ellipsoidal height, and we need to cross between two different GCSs and possibly two different VCSs. That would be a different transformation type. 
And then finally, between two gravity-related heights. So for instance, VERCON would be an example in the US where you'd be going from NGVD 29 to NEVD 88, for instance. Occasionally, we'll, we'll run into a case where uh, perhaps the transformations are file-based. So we need an interpolation GCS to, to use the file, and we don't have a direct transformation. So in that case, you might end up doing something like, OK, a 2D geographic to get me over to another GCS, and then finally go to another VCS. Then finally, I can go back and get to that target that I wanted on GCS A, but I want a VCS, VCS 2. So kind of indirect, but still there's a way to get there. So right now, the methods we're supporting several different model types and models, uh, vertcon and vertical offset and vertical offset and slope, which are both what I call equation-based. You don't need any external data to support those. Uh, they're available in the project tool and project raster tool. In pro, they're in both maps and scenes, but only in local scenes. Uh, global does support it, but you're restricted to WS84 and then the EGM models, 96 or 2008. And the web scene viewer and other applications also support them. Um, and then finding an the extract LAS tool does also support vertical transformations. So one thing that happened a couple several releases ago is that we started putting in the vertical data that you need to support the transformations. And I had to go to management and go, hey, I've got over a gig of data I want to put into the to the core setup, software setups. And they basically went, yeah, yeah you're kidding us, no way. So there is a separate ArcGIS coordinate systems data setup in addition to, for instance, the pro setup or the desktop setup. Any new data that comes in that we need for transformations is going into this separate data setup. Um, if you have access to it, you can go into my Esri and look at these, or whoever does the installs for your company, you can tell them to go look under either uh, my organizations and then downloads and then search on coordinate systems, or go under data and content. You'll see them there. They are tied to a uh, software release, but if you have one installed for Pro or for Desktop, it'll work for both versions of the software. Uh, you just need to make sure that the coordinate system data matches the more recent version of that software, either Pro or Desktop, whichever one is there. It goes into a neutral location, doesn't install, for instance, under Pro or under the Desktop setups. So right now it's creeping up to almost two gigabytes of additional data. For Pro 2.7, so they're, they're, the, old, the older data, for instance, like the original NADCON, older NTP2 files for various parts of the world. Um, there's even an EGM96 version that's in there. Those are in the, those are, those were installed on the core setup because they predated this giant amount of data that had to go in. For Pro 2.7, we actually duplicated all of those data over to the coordinate systems um, data setup. That was partially for um, not the mainline software Pro and desktop, but for other software like runtime where they wanted the, those data files and didn't want to have to try and pull from two different locations to get all the files. So basically all the data got put into one place so they can just pull that and it's good for all of these other software packages that, that we're supporting. On the geographic transformation side, it includes Geocon version one, NATCON five, NTP two for a whole bunch of different countries. On the vertical side, it's got VertCon, Geoid 12B and 18 for the US, uh, some Geoid models, and then the EGM84 and EGM2008 models for, for the worldwide from NGA. We're, we, we're going slower than I like and getting more Joid models in for various parts of the country. Part of that is because everybody's got their own different file formats. We either have to support it or we've got to, to, re, um, to build it into a format we do support. Uh, we also occasionally are running into uh, issues where we need licensing and we need to get that sorted out as well. Everything that's coming down the pike that's in there but not uh, not supported widely in the software is that uh, WKT2 support. So for instance, for a shape file, there's a P or J file and there's a one on text string that's, that describes the coordinate reference system. There's now a version, a newer version of that called one, colloquially one on text two, uh, much more flexible, supports a lot more information. We have it in the software, but currently only using it for geo packages, which requires it. 
And again, we're discussing how to make this available more widely in the software for, for other locations. So what are we, what are we working on still? So one thing is that, okay, Jeffrey also talked about this. IOGP has the EPSG Geode geodetic registry that they basically support, or at least list a lot of different coordinate reference systems, units, datums, ellipsoids, transformations around the world. And, you know, we support that. I'm on the committee. Blue Marble also has someone on the committee that helps support that. There is now a second registry out there for ISO itself, International Standards Organization. And EPSG is trading information back and forth with them. So basically, if ISO puts something in, then EPSG puts it in. And then basically, Esri or Blue Marble sucks that in from the EPSG side mostly. <clears throat> Connected to that, there's, I don't know if anyone remembers this, but several, several years ago, there was a geospatial integrity of geoscience software push where there was a big set of test data and test cases published, <coughs> excuse me, that uh, a software vendor could run their data against and basically come up with a report and say, okay, we support this area, we don't support that area, we support these, but there's an issue here. And it wasn't designed to basically, um, you know, fail a software company if their, their software is unusable, but it was more to tell you the limits, what is usable and where's areas where you need to be careful or you need to make sure you understand what's happening. Um, there were some issues with the data in that, like I had run enough of it to, to know that we were good kind of at the, the, the math level, um, but I never wrote, wrote a report about it because you're supposed to write a report about it. The last few years, there's been a new uh, committee working on this and they're getting ready, hopefully to release this year, an online version of this so that software vendors can go through again and, and like update and tell you what's available and what's not available in their software related to this. So that's one of the things that I'm lo looking, uh, I'll say I'm looking forward to it, <laughs> maybe that coming out this year and then uh, we'll work on that, try and get that out. Uh, we're still trying, we're still working on time-based transformations, both inter-frame where you're converting between two dynamic geodetic reference frames at a particular time or to a particular epoch. For instance, going between um, the latest WS84 realization and an ITRF realization, for instance, and inter-frame where you're converting between two epochs, two times. Uh, basically, my team feels that we need data model changes in Esri to support that. For instance, storing the EPIC data with the data, native support of XYZ data, 3D, 3D Cartesian. <clears throat> um, and as part of that, we have people that are working with two standards groups that are working on this as well. There's a GGXF file format, basically a standard file format for geodetic data that's being worked on, on at, um, at o OpenGIS. OGS and um, and also a deformation model one that would help with interframe changes that would be earthquakes or subsistence that type of thing so that we know what, so we can help and we can know what's going on with these um, but right now it's it's our team getting together the documentation to talk to management about what would happen because it's not just my team that would have to do that it would like we, we would be the support of that but then we got to get every other team to be able to implement and use all of that new new information and new data model changes. Okay, so I wanted to switch over quickly and just show a couple of the things in ArcGIS Pro. So let's see if I can manage that. Are you seeing ArcGIS Pro? Yes. Excellent, thank you. So this is actually 2.8 beta. So you're seeing this a little bit of advance of most of everybody else. Two, there's a beta being generated this week, but I want to show you some of the new stuff that's in there. So here's the coordinate systems tab for the properties of the map. We can see that we've got the current XY, the current coordinate system for the map is NAT A3 Harn. If we go and look at layers way up here, you can see the actual layer itself is a NAT A3. And then one of the things I talked about was that projection wizard. So it 
Pro 2.7, so that's the previous release, they added this new suggested projected coordinate system. And this is that projection wizard that I talked about. So you've got a new name, you could, it's picking up the GCS of the map, but you can change that. <clears throat> and then you can decide what your extent is. This is to build um, a custom coordinate system for your data extent. So you don't want to use anything that's existing in, in the, we already, the already support, you want to use something new. You can either update the, the extent yourself, or you can go ahead and use, for instance, the extent of the layer or the extent of all the layers in the map. Um, you can change the display units you're going to have. And then what you can also do is you can say, OK, I'm going to be doing analysis with this data, and I want to use an equal area projection for it, or I want to use a conformal projection or equidistant from one point or equidistant along meridians. So for instance, if I go ahead and say equal area, then I get a custom Albers projection using meters. And there's my custom parameters for the data of that layer that I've got on the map. One thing we would, might want to work on with this in the future, which I've been agitating for, is something similar to this, but, but using the existing coordinate reference systems that we support so that you might get the UTM zone for the area or you might get one for the, the countrywide that would still support this area. Something that's new at 2.8 for transformations is they reworked this dialogue again. So for instance, here, here is my layer coordinate system. Here's the map coordinate system. Right now there's no vertical coordinate systems. And then here is the transformation uh, that's currently being picked for this data. If I do the pull down, there's my list where we've generated this crazy list of all these transformations available to get from NAT83 to NAT83 HARN for this data. <clears throat> but the one thing that we really, really are happy about is now there's a details button. So once you pick this transformation, you can now hit details and now you get the name, the input and output CRS, and then if there's more than one step in this path, for instance, you saw on that list, there were ones that had more than one path, more than one step. You can get information on all the steps that's being used, the method, the file name, um, interpolation methods that's being used for that method, and then the extent for that transformation. So we've been looking for this for a long time. Yeah, there was, you could get the per, you could get the parameters and desktop, but you can get all this other information. So in this case, where the method is a file-based one, you're getting the file name. If it was an equation-based one, you'd be getting those parameters instead. The other thing that's new here is this additional transformation section here. Uh, one thing you could do in desktop that you couldn't do in Pro was that if you were planning to publish a map out onto the into the web into a service you could go ahead and you could kind of fake it out and you could say okay i know that i'm using nat 83 and 93 harn someone might want to use nat 27 too because of, we got somebody in another office who loves that um, i'm going to go ahead and add in the transformation i want to use to get from nat 83 to nat 27 and you could add that transformation in basically it would go kind of into this hidden uh, list and then if someone asked for that service in that 27, it would know autom automatically, oh, I already need, I need to do this transformation. So you had better control over what transformations were being used. So this, so this is the same functionality, but in Pro made very public that I could go ahead and I could go ahead and add a transformation, say, okay, I'm gonna set up my coordinate systems to these other ones I wanna use, and then go ahead and set that transformation. And that would get published out to the service as well. So that's a new, new thing coming in 2.8, really pleased about it. Okay, that's it for me. So are there any questions? Any questions from anybody? I um, I really like the, the transformation details. That's pretty cool. <laughs> we, it was really funny. It's another team having to do it because we have no UI people on my team. And no. so we were going back and forth between, no, no, you can't leave out that part. You've got all this information. You have to show all the information. <laughs> <laughs> you want what in here? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How many things? Yeah. Yeah. Is anybody going to use this? It, that's actually really cool. That's, that's neat. 
Um, well, thanks for the presentation. I don't, I'm not hearing any questions. Um, I, I, I did wonder like, oh, wait, there, you know how you can go I out think, and- oh. I think there's somebody. Oh, somebody on? Okay, go ahead. My microphone is working. Can you hear me now? Oh, Ryan, I can barely hear you. I'm, I'm wondering if your headset's not working because it, yeah, it seems it's like it's coming through the computer audio. I can't hear him at all now. I don't know, maybe type it in chat. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, while we're waiting for that question, um, so I I I uh, figured out where in my organizations to go download the new Arc Pro CRS data. And what yeah. I was wondering is, and I know that's the file that you guys are continuously updating with like new transformations and stuff. So at what point in time would you need to use that? In other words, what, what, what comes with it out of the gate, just sort of the basic stuff, and then you get that as an add-on? Okay, so if you have it, okay, so the question came through, um, when you download the new coordinate system pack within Arc Pro, do you just point to the directory you downloaded it to? You don't have to do anything except install the setup. It by default it'll install like, like normally if you would install to program systems, you know, ArcGIS or Esri or ArcGIS, whatever the main topic is, and then you got Pro and Desktop listed, it would go at that, that same level. So you would see coordinate systems listed at the same level that Pro is at, and that way both Desktop and Pro can see it. Um, but, um, yeah, does that, yeah, it's just an installer, basically. You don't have to point to it or anything. I mean, if you want to, you, I guess you could, but you don't, you don't need to. Um, so back to your question, the, what comes in the course setups is there's, a, there's almost no vertical transformation data. And the way we have the, we have two lists. We have a, we have a geographic transformation list function and a, and a horizontal vertical transformation list function. Both of these functions check to see if the data is available. So if you say, hey, I wanna go between whatever and, 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 and it can't see the data because you haven't installed this setup or setup, you won't see the transformations. So okay. you, would, you would get a much reduced list if any list of what, what's available. So, so basically if you're doing any vertical, you definitely have to install it. You can install pieces of it. You don't have to install the whole thing if you wanna go in there, but it's, but it's real broad, right? Um, any newer NTP2 transformation, this went in about 1.4 for Pro and 10.4 for ArcGIS. So anything later than that, so in the last five, six years, you would have to install that external setup to catch it. So if you want the newer NGS transformations from NatCon 5 or Geocon, you have to install this setup. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think server may actually ping you. And once you get done server, it may actually say, hey, by the way, you might want to install this data too. But I don't think it forces you to. And we've been kind of debating in house too, like, yeah, maybe we should force it <laughs> to install the data because it's just getting to the point where there's so much data there now and it's all newer stuff that's better that you really need to get them installed. Yeah, okay. Great, thanks for that. Any other questions for Melita? Uh, Jeffrey sent me a note, he, um, he had a hard stop at four and so he, uh, he apologized, but he said he's more than willing to take any questions that we might have offline um, and alternatively you can email us and we can put you in touch with him as well. He's, he's fine with, with that. Well, if there's nothing else, no other questions, um, just want to thank you again. Uh, let's see, I wanted to put up some contact info, um, northtexaspug at gmail.com. Uh, will reach any of us on the steering committee, quite frankly. And so if you want to, if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out. Wanted to also get Sam um, to give us a quick update, if you don't mind, Sam, on 
the upcoming Esri uh, events? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's a couple of things uh, that are happening um, every year. Well, it happens every year. As, as you all know, we're moving to this virtual world. I'm going to share my screen real quick, uh, if I can. Um, so if you, if you guys can see uh, my screen, I encourage you to go to esri.com uh, slash events. Uh, it will take you to this page. Um, once you get to this page, there's a, there's a few uh, items there and resources that you can uh, use. But if you go to the bottom of the, of the page, it will actually uh, give you a list of all, of all the events that we have left uh, this year, as well as webinars, et cetera. Uh, the Esri Partner Conference just happened. The Dev Summit is happening uh, April 6th to 8th. And then for this particular group, we're always very interested, obviously, in the Petroleum GIS Conference, which will happen May 4th through 6th. So it's going to be over three days, uh, one session in the morning, one session in the afternoon uh, for three days straight. We're working hard in the content of that conference right now. It is a no cost um, <clears throat> to all Esri uh, customers. And we're taking this year, we're taking an approach, a very business-like approach, where we're always, as always, we're going to cover technology. Uh, but as you see, the agenda is going to be very business focused. Uh, so that should allow you to invite uh, even more people, even outside of GIS managers, directors, et cetera, to come and, uh, and see the content. Uh, we think it will be very relevant uh, for them. We're also going to spend quite a bit of time talking more about this uh, um, kind of renewables direction that the oil and gas companies are going in in relation to carbon footprint uh, and some of those things. Um, and then the S user conference will be July 12 to 15, and that will also be virtual and we, it will also be at no cost uh, to the S customers. Uh, the last thing I want to do is I want to point out in this page if you go to past events, you can actually look at the conference that have already happened. Um, but I'm gonna put, for example, the Fed GIS conference. If you click here, and it's going to take you to the federal GIS conference, and you can actually watch the video. So if you click on the watch playlist, you can actually see all the plenary videos that happen in the Fed GIS conference. So even though we're in a virtual environment and we would love to be all together, uh, I guess the blessing in these guys is that actually now you can attend all these conferences. You can go back, see the videos, see the content, et cetera. Uh, so go back to that page of Esri events. Uh, again, we want to highlight the Petroleum User Group and the UC, but all the other conferences that are there, you have the ability to attend to them and look at uh the technology and how it's being leveraged, not only in oil and gas, but in other industries as well. And that can definitely spark some other ideas on how to use the technology. So, uh, so again, you know, um, as much as there has been a change for us, we do also uh, acknowledge that it has opened uh, much more opportunities for us to participate in more events and have access to more content. And I encourage everybody to take advantage of it. Thank you, Bob. Thanks, Sam. That's exciting. Um, yeah. A lot of resources yeah. out there, it looks like, sure. to go and, and peruse. So we'll be sure to do that. Um, there was one question from Ryan that came in, um, if Melita is still around. It was about whether Melita knows about a, a web map that shows boat movement with the, wow, spillhouse projection. <laughs> so I did, I, did answer, I did answer Ryan in the chat. Oh, cool. um, Spielhouse is the one that's the ocean, like the connected ocean. Oh yeah, the ocean centric, cool. So, so I told him to just drop me an email, and I would try and find something. I don't know of anything offhand. There is a story map on it, like how we how we built it and everything. So, like if you search story map, Spielhouse, you'll probably hit a link for it. Um, and I know our cartographers were like super excited getting an ocean connected map, so like they know they did some, but I don't know if we have any boat movement. So I need to check and see if I can find something. Okay. Okay, great. Yeah, great question. <laughs> it's pretty neat. Never seen anything like that. That's, that's no, pretty that's, awesome. Yeah. I can see how there's a, there'll be a lot of uh, use case for that. Our, our crazy geeky people. Oh, Ryan's found it already. So. Oh, nice. so in the chat, he's got the link to the story map. <laughs> oh, awesome. Thanks, Ryan. Great. Well, 
any other questions or um, any anybody want to discuss anything? We've got a minute or two. All right. Well, appreciate your time. We get, get you out of here five minutes early, and um, really thanks for attending. We uh, we uh, really appreciate it and appreciate the speakers. Thank you to Esri. Thank you to Blue Marble um, for presenting. And we will catch you on the next one. Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Thank you.